Hello everyone, Mike Mulroney here with this edition of Shirley Talk, and today we have Miss Jenny Brown. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the organization that she has started, Breeze Blessings, please look them up. What's the website for that? It's www.breezeblessings, that's B-R-E-E-S, we always get a lot of confusion on that, but B-R-E-E-S blessings.org okay. or dot .com. Yeah, either, either one. It goes, yeah. yeah. Um, so I know a little bit about the story, but uh, I, you want to talk about how Breeze Blessings started? Your daughter was fighting a rare form of cancer. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So my daughter Bree was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma in December of 2015. She was 12 years old, getting ready to turn 13. <laughs> Um, of course, that kind of turned our world upside down, and she battled for two and a half years. How did she find out she had that? We, we try to cover a little bit about what were their symptoms. Was she sick all the time or in pain? Ewing sarcoma looks painful to me. It's so. very painful. Um, and actually, before she was diagnosed, she was um, a dancer. And so that May, she was practicing for her recital in the kitchen, and she fell. Um, which our house is on a slab, so she landed on concrete. Ugh. And it kind of hurt, you know, but it got better. And then the pain came back. So for a short while, we thought it was just related to her fall. Um, but then within a couple of months after that, we decided that it probably wasn't related so anymore. So it lasted, the pain lasted that long? It never went away. Okay. Um, so we were going back and forth to the pediatrician pretty much on a monthly basis. And oddly enough, we had a campsite out in New Washington. I mean, it's a small little town in Indiana. There's nothing there but a gas station. And another family had a campsite right beside of us. Um, and we didn't know each other at all, but I heard that he had, the child had been diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma. And when I heard his symptoms, I was like, that is exactly. What are the odds? Like a campground, like at a park? Like a tiny, it's a conservation club. Okay. And so it's a permanent campground. Okay. Um, and I heard his symptoms and I was like, that's exactly what Bree is going through right now. So I even went into the pediatrician and took her out into the hall and I said, you know, I heard about this kid that has this and her symptoms are really similar. I think she may have Ewing sarcoma or possibly osteosarcoma because I'd kind of started looking at that point. And she said, I think you might be right, you know, so we're going to do some lab work and do an x-ray. And um, the x-ray is not the best tool to diagnose Ewing sarcoma. So both came back normal. Neither are labs, like her labs wouldn't have flagged anything or yeah, it wouldn't have flagged anything as being different. Um, and so we went home and we were treating her for um, like piriformis syndrome. I don't even know what that is. So the piriformis <laughs> muscle is the big muscle in your butt basically. Okay. okay. And that she had damaged that is what we thought. Okay. So two months of pain in there. Yeah. And so we're stretching, um, doing Hoping a lot of not, like, yeah. yeah. So it just so happened it was Thanksgiving weekend. And her brother was a freshman. It was the big rival game. We have Thanksgiving weekend every year between our school district and the district right beside of us. And uh, we went to watch the game and she couldn't sit down the whole time we were there. She was just really uncomfortable. And the only way she could feel better was if she was walking. So she just walked the whole entire time during the game. And then the next morning she woke up and was in excruciating pain. And I had her down on the floor doing her stretches. Um, like physical therapy activities with the doctor. This is abnormal pain for a muscle. Yes. Some sort yeah. Of so we ended up at the ER that night, and um, that's when we found out. So you found out in the ER. We found out in the ER. What did they do a different? CT. What type of test did they do to finally expose that? Was it some sort of blood test or something? Or no, her labs know? came back great there too. Um, it was a CT scan that they did. Did they notice uh, what shows up in a CT scan on something like that? Is it is Ewing sarcoma like tumors on the bones or something? <laughs> yeah. So they saw a they saw a large tumor, wow. a very large tumor in her okay. pelvis. Um, and we were in there for a long time, but I didn't think much of it because it was the ER. You know, you're yeah. going to be in there forever. Um, but come to find out, the reason we were there so long was he was he had called the radiologist who had read the um, read the CT scan, and he was in Hawaii. He had called her pediatrician, 
he had called other staff members there in the hospital to come in and look at it. He wanted to be certain Absolutely. before he came in and told us. That's good because we've entered, uh, interviewed other patients where uh, random doctors just walk in and they don't verify anything and they just blurt out what they think it is. No, this that's doctor good. was amazing. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And he came in, he was very considerate in him delivering the news. Um, but I was just kind of like completely, obviously I was, even though I had suspected it before, I was still completely caught off guard. So yeah. it, That's was, never it was hard news to you swallow. Hear, obviously. Yeah. So the next morning we were admitted at, Co it was Cozair at the time, um, where she began treatments and she battled her first round um, for almost a year. And we had gone to Chicago for proton radiation, and um, she had come back home and was finishing up the school year. She got to go back to school. She was doing physical therapy three or four days a week. And at June, when school was getting out, we decided we weren't going to make her do physical therapy anymore. We were going to let her be normal and enjoy life. And she had scans three weeks later, and she had relapsed. Mm -hmm. So from there, we went to Cincinnati Children's where we finished out her treatment. Um, and it was just right under a year. She relapsed in um, July, July 22nd was the date, or June 22nd, I'm sorry, was the date in 2017. And she passed away June 13th of 2018. Wow. I just hard to, to I, I can't even put myself in your shoes and nobody can. I've got three kids and to, to have that diagnosis and then watch it, I, I guess she was probably in a lot of, could they do anything to control the pain at, at some point? They did a decent job of controlling it. Of course, nothing really takes it away, um, yeah. but she was on a pain pump, especially like the, the relapse part of her treatments was extremely painful. Um, so she stayed on a pain pump a lot when we were in Cincinnati and just pain pills constantly around the clock, you know? So she's in this pain, knowing that there's probably not nothing else they can do. And she's 15 at this time. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had a vision of trying to do something special with kids. And she was sound like she was a very artistic, musically gifted yes. child. So what is it that Bree's Blessings does at this point? She Didn't she write out what she thought and wanted to do? She did. When she came home on hospice, she sat down with me and another lady who ran a nonprofit that helped us a lot, who's no longer, um, they're not around anymore. They dissolved. But, um, and she told us what she wanted her legacy to be. And she at wrote 15. down and took notes. Yes. <sighs> yeah, I was floored. Um, so truly, she's the founder of Breeze Blessings. Yeah. But she laid the guideline and the foundation for everything that we do. And we try very hard to make sure that we do exactly what she asked. And anytime there's a decision to be made, of course, it's like, what would Bree want? And that's how we decide. Um, but yeah, so we provide opportunities for pediatric cancer patients to further their interest in music and art as a method of coping with their diagnosis and treatments. Um, because the treatments and just the diagnosis and everything that comes with it is so stressful. Um, and Brie, Brie relied heavily on music and art therapy while she was in treatment. And it was a big part of her treatment plan. Like I consider that a part of her treatment plan was working with the music and art therapist there at Norton's. And they built really good relationships. And she wanted to be able to assist kids in the same manner that she had been assisted. So that was important for her. And um, it's, it's pretty awesome, like getting feedback from families that have received assistance from us and their kids and how much that gift has helped them yeah. get through the process too. So, you know, before my child was diagnosed, I never would have thought that a ukulele would make that much of a difference or you know, a sewing machine would make that much of a difference or whatever it might be, but it truly does. And yeah. it's, uh, it's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, music is uh, something else. I know several musicians and they can really, you know, they play music as, a, as therapy to, to kind of, I don't know, get out of their head, I guess, mm -hmm. for a little while. But, you know, what kind of kid was Brie? To, to be at 15, knowing she's probably towards the end, to have that mentality to think of others. I mean, was she one of those kids that would lean towards helping others when she was little? I mean, how, I mean, how do you, I She know. was such a selfless person that always put everyone else before herself. 
And um, she obviously learned that from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if she, I, I feel like it was just, she was just born that way. I mean, she was just, she was amazing. Obviously, you know, it is important in, in our family to give back and yeah. do for others. And um, she was brought up around that, but she just, she was amazing. She so, was truly special. So how is Bree's Blessings funded? Do y'all have several events during the year? Or used to in the old days? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we work really hard. Um, and, of course, we're a newer organization. You know, we started yeah. when she passed away. Um, so in lieu of flowers, we asked for donations. And that kind of got us started. And, of course, with, like, supplies, we had so many donations coming in after she died, like, that first year. Um that really got us going and then we just kind of built on it from there so yeah we do fundraisers and um one thing that we've done every year so far has been a yard sale which doesn't sound like a lot but we actually like did really well with our yard sale last year i was yeah. surprised at how yeah. well we did with our yard sale yeah. um and so then in 20 19 we had uh beats for blessings because we want to try to incorporate music you know into our fundraising as well so we did beats for blessings which was super amazing and we had that at the grand in new albany okay uh, and we had the caribou caribou perform yeah they're amazing yes they are a young band called between the lines which um, Never heard of they're, them. they're very young like 16 17 year old kids okay. phenomenal everyone loved them too and then we had the Louisville Crashers that closed out the event. So it was a lot of fun. Of course, in 2020, we weren't able to do that because of COVID. Yeah, yeah. So instead, last this year, we did a golf scramble, which replaced the income from Beats for Blessings, and it went over really well. So we were planning on doing that again for 2021 and then bringing back um, Beats for Blessings as well. So the money you raise, uh, how do you find out, or, or do y'all actively pursue kids that are looking for an outlet, or do you, does Cozair, the hospitals contact you when they have somebody that might be a good candidate for what it is you all do? So a little bit of both. Um, we we serve kids that are in receiving active treatment in Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio. Okay. Um, obviously Indiana because we live there. Brie never did treatment in Indiana, but, and then Kentucky and Ohio because that's where she received treatment. Um, and so the, we have contacts at the hospital who will contact us if they have a specific kid who has a need. Um, but we also do delivery bags before COVID. Yeah. We did delivery bags every quarter um, and we would take about 35 bags to each hospital um, and they would have art and music gifts in them with a postcard attached to it saying that you can get this one time wish gift valued up to $300 and how to apply for that gift. So that's kind of how we got started. And now of course it's just kind of word of mouth, like yeah. families know. Um, but when COVID hit and we realized that we weren't going to be able to do the delivery bags any longer or for now anyways, um, we rolled out blessing boxes, which is kind of like a lot of the subscription services you see like Ipsy or whatever, where they send a package to your house each month. So we send our kiddos a package each month that has arts and crafts in it that they can work on from home. Um, and that's went over really well. So I think we're going to continue to do that. And then once COVID restrictions lift some, then we'll do the delivery bags along with the blessing boxes. That's amazing. Where do you get the supplies? Do you all buy them or do you all have a connection at one of the big box stores that maybe makes some donations or something? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we run we into that problem as well. You know, and I don't, you know, when you're, we're still fairly new too. Yeah. Sometimes they look at us like we're crazy. So, yeah. but you know, they get hit up all the time for stuff. They do. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, um, we, we purchase whatever, okay. you know, and we have some donations that still come in, not as many, not nearly as many as when we first started. Now right. people just give money and that's fine. Um, so we'll buy whatever we need and, and just get it to them. So it's amazing. Yeah. And yeah. then we also do like, aside from that, as we've gone along, we've realized that there's other needs that need to be fulfilled. And while we can't do everything, cause we know we can't do everything, you know, we refer people to other organizations for certain things, but with some of our families, um, we have added, not with some, with all of our families, we have a general fund now where we can pull from it if we need to. We have discretionary funds. So like if we have a kiddo who 
wouldn't meet the criteria of getting a wish gift from us, like maybe they lived in Tennessee or something. Mm -hmm. um, as a board, we could decide if we wanted to allow that kid in to get a wish gift or whatever it might be. Um, we have used that for some emergency situations at Norton's for one specific example, and uh, I don't even know the child's name, I couldn't share it if I did, but um, a foster kid was in the hospital with cancer who only came in with what she was wearing and absolutely nothing else um, and had been in there for weeks. And so someone from the hospital contacted me and we went and bought this child like everything you could imagine. We got her an iPad, we took her sheets, we took her pillows, we took her clothes, bra, shoes, socks, like everything that you could imagine. Um, yeah, I've heard stories like that, and I got a little aggravated when I heard things like that, and, and every situation is different, but one of the nurses corrected me and said, look, these families, they have to work, or they can't pay for their kid to be here. Mm -hmm. So I was told there's several kids at, at these children's hospitals that a lot of times they don't have anybody coming because it might be out of town. Mm -hmm. You know, Cincinnati, people drive up from Louisville all the time, yeah, or Indiana as well, and, and you know, they can't stay there the whole time. I just can't fathom, and I, I, we would if we had to to leave your child there as they're sick but yes. it happens more than we realize it does yeah it, especially when you think about single moms or single dads yeah. who you know don't have the luxury of not working because they carry the insurance so and have to pay the bills and probably have other kids at home yeah and uh it's it's truly heartbreaking and eye-opening i remember when brie was in the hospital like there were two babies there who would just sit up by the nurse's station in wagons and I was so heartbroken. I was like, can I just take them in a breeze yeah. room with me? And no, you can't, you know, because yeah. of cross-contamination. But I was like, can I just walk them around the halls or something? Pay some attention to yeah, them. Like, yeah, like, I felt it was so terrible. Yeah, no, I get it. I, I thought the same thing. And I was, like I said, I was really appalled by it. But there's there's reasons for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's usually financial reasons, yeah. you know. I, most people wouldn't leave their kids there, but they have to because they have to work. Yeah. And it's just heartbreaking that people are in those situations. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know from what you do, but when Brie was diagnosed, I had to quit working. Mm -hmm. I worked a full time job for Humana, so I made pretty decent money yeah. and had a photography business on the side. So, I mean, that was a huge chunk that yeah. we lost. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, my husband made enough to cover most everything, and we had a lot of assistance <laughs> from just people, you know, so many generous people out there that it carried us through. But, a lot of people don't have that support and a lot of people don't have that extra person in the household that they can rely on. No, we see it every day. Yeah. And Bree was very lucky that you were able to do that and spend time with her. Yeah. So, well, how can people get involved? What's the website again? And it's uh, org and or dot com. <laughs> and, um, if they want to get involved, there's a number of different ways that they could get involved. It could be as simple as like, signing up for Kroger Rewards. It could be That's volunteering time. Yes, like Kroger Rewards are so awesome. Yeah, we got a copy An of the Amazon check we, got, we did that and showed last night during our drawing. The Kroger Rewards thing adds up and, and Amazon. It doesn't cost people anything. People right. don't realize that, yeah. um, but it doesn't cost anything. Yeah. Um, so that's good. Well, nice to finally meet you. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I've, I've watched your old story for a while now, and I was glad you were able to make it in and, and tell your story. I didn't know all of that about there, but music does really help people. It truly does. Um, we're looking at interviewing somebody here soon that has uh, has really done a lot of research on what music can do mm -hmm. to people, not only in general, but people who are sick. So right. I'm looking forward to, to having that person in here. Absolutely. Well, thanks for stopping by, and yeah. we'll keep in touch. And again, Breeze Blessings, please look them up, get out, volunteer to help. Uh, Kroger Rewards, Amazon Smiles, all of those, and uh, make them one of your charities of choice. Thanks so much.